Morning, everybody. So we still got a few minutes. This is really loud. I'm sorry, I have a very loud voice and it always bothers me any time my microphone up because I'm worried I'm gonna like deafen everybody. Uh, and you at the camera, I'll apologize. I pace a whole lot during my talks. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, so we still got a couple minutes. I just wanted to get a sense of uh, like what types of folks are in the audience. Uh, how many testers are in the audience? Yay, testers of the developer conference, good for you. Oh, it's not Rakia. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I've had coffee this morning, nothing else. Uh, okay, so a handful of testers, thanks. Uh, how many program managers or business analysts? A couple? Okay, thank you. Uh, and then developers? Okay, surprise. Any other role that I didn't call out? So I ask that because it helps me to understand who I'm talking to. This really is a very broad, generalized talk about quality, and it's not specific about testing, it's not specific about uh, things, so it helps me understand that I do indeed have a bunch of different roles here in the audience. And this is bouncing all over the place. This is going to drive me crazy. Uh, all right, so good first day yesterday at the conference. A few thumbs up. Everybody else is still asleep. Not enough coffee this morning. Sorry, can't help you. <clears throat> all right, um, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started just a minute early because after all, and my timer isn't working. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm Jim. Hi. There's my contact information up there. Don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have questions. I mean, I'll be around in the halls most of the day. Uh, if you have some questions, go ahead and drop me an email, jim at guidepost systems. I started early, it's okay. Um, I'm on Twitter, I blog at Frazzled Dad. I've been the primary caregiver for two small children. Frazzled, gray beard, go figure. Uh, you don't need, the only slide you need to take a picture of is this one here, because the entire deck that I have is up on speaker deck, and you'll be able to get all the slides from there. So um, my slides are kind of a little gonzo usually. Uh, you may or may not be able to get a lot of information out of them, but uh, that's where you can find them. And again, do not hesitate, if you've got questions after the conference, to drop me an email. Happy to talk about things. So <clears throat> this talk, my goals for you are to get some ideas, maybe some different ideas, maybe reinforce things you're already doing, but it's around how to have better conversations for quality. Um, so understanding maybe some new types of questions, some new things to ask as you're moving along. Uh, so first off, who assures quality? For those of you who are testers, do you have a quality assurance title? Do testers assure quality? Do they, in most cases, do the testers write the code? What about developers? Developers write the code. Do they assure the quality? There's one yes there. Okay. So do developers set budget for the project? Do developers set timelines, deadlines, or features? So two, and, and so, I'm sure you've heard the mantra, the whole team is responsible for quality. Well, no, there's really one person, and that person is the person that writes the checks, the stakeholder, because the stakeholder can make sure that we have the right people, we have enough people, that we have resources. People are not resources, but that we have the right infrastructure, that we have a reasonable deadline, that we have clear priorities. So. Good quality comes from having a close, tight relationship with the stakeholder because that's who you need to be having conversations with about clarity for all of the things you're doing. So I have another question for you, and, and yes, that's right, you have to talk this early in the morning. Sorry. What's quality? Somebody have any ideas? 
Come on. Anybody? Okay. So a lot of times I'll hear things like, it meets specifications. There are no bugs. Um, there's a very interesting fellow, Jerry Weinberg, who uh, was a longtime thought leader in software, and he did consulting, he did a lot of writing, he did a lot of mentoring, and he had this very interesting uh, notion of what quality was, and it's something that's of value to someone. And so this brings up a very interesting idea. If we take that to heart, does quality always have to be some high-performing piece of code? Sometimes quality has nothing to do with software, rather it has understanding of the problem that we're trying to solve. Many years ago, I was at a uh, software conference that I helped run, <coughs> excuse me, and one of the sponsors had a software coding problem. And I don't even remember what the nature of the problem was, but the idea was to have this funky uh, event going on at their booth. They'd get a lot of people come by, they'd get a lot of interest, there were prizes, all sorts of things. And everybody wrote some really interesting solutions for this problem. They did things in Ruby, somebody used Python, there were people on the .NET platform, this was before JavaScript was really hot. The person who won solved the problem using Microsoft Word. It's value. Here's a contest, everybody's going and throwing code, and I'm test driving this, and we did pair programming, and this guy had literally forgotten his laptop, so we borrowed somebody else's and wrote something up in Microsoft Word using a table, won, it just won the program. That sponsor changed the rules next year. So, you know, the idea of <clears throat> what quality is, um, isn't just all of the technical things. Quality, at the end of the day, really, are we solving something for the customer and the end user? Does it fit their needs? Is it the right features? Um, does it perform well? Is it actually in use in production? And some days, all the customer wants is just their job to suck less, all right? So if we think from the business side, there's a lot of different things about quality, such as cutting risk. Business is often very concerned about avoiding lawsuits. So we're not exposing our users' information. We're not allowing the system to get hacked. We are um, complying with legal mandates from the government, from the state, from the federal government, you're right, the, na the national government. Um, Quality can also mean having enough information to just simply make the next decision. If you're a fan of uh, lean manufacturing and, and some of the ideas that we bring from lean manufacturing over into lean software, then there's a notion of just in time, right? I'm not trying to plan three steps ahead. I need to have an, a general idea of where we're going, but what I really need is if I have that direction, I need enough information to take the next step. And then once I'm there, I want to make sure I'm in the right direction, but then I need enough information to take the next step. So quality <clears throat> can mean a number of things, and it's important to understand that business quality is very different than technical quality. Business does not care what platform you're on. They don't care if you're using the latest hot thing from Angular, React, Cowbell 4.502, what they want is to ensure that their needs are being met. And that's very different from making case for test-driven development or using whatever testing framework or using something else, right? And too often, we on the technical side don't pay attention to those business quality things. And that's part of what I'm trying to get out in this talk is paying a little more attention to what's going on with business. So, where and when should conversations about quality happen? I say they should be happening all the time. Too often, we leave quality and testing and you know, all of this stuff till late in the game, if not the very last thing. Oh, we'll write this stuff, we'll build it, <clears throat> and then we'll hand it over to the testers. Okay, if, if you don't know this, that went out of style in like 1960. 
Things have changed, all right? So we should be having conversations about quality and about testing all the time. So regardless of what process you use, don't fix on the exact terms that I've got here. The point I'm trying to make is that, you know, at some point, a stakeholder or somebody in the organization has an idea. So that's the ideation phase, right? From there, <clears throat> um, there's some decisions made. We want to go ahead and move and actually start planning out what a release might look like. From there, we actually are doing the work. We work in iterations, and it doesn't matter if you're doing iterations or Kanban or sprints or waterfall phase release, right? It's the idea that you're starting off with an idea, you plan out what you're doing, you start to do the actual work, and then you're doing the work, okay? So that's kind of what the flow means here. So in ideation, the quality discussions should be trying to validate the assumptions that the stakeholder and the business have. And we'll get into more detail about this. In release planning, remember, what we're trying to do is get enough information to make good decisions and move on down the process, okay? So in release planning, we look to different things. Is this the right thing? Are we building the right scope of stuff? Um, what integrations do we have to have, both with third-party tools or internal components? Um, what are acceptance criteria for what we're building? Then we get into actual planning for the next iteration, or the first iteration. Um, and at this point, it's really important to understand for each little work item that we have, and it doesn't matter if it's a task in TFS or Visual Studio Team System, or if it's a card in Rally, or I'm sorry if people are still working in Jira because that's awful, but you know, the point being you have a work item. All right? Do you understand why you're building that? Is the value of that clear? Because that ties directly to how much quality that thing is going to deliver. <coughs> Excuse me. During actual building, the conversations that we have, okay, I've got a task, I've got a user story, I'm doing some coding on that. <coughs> I want to pair up. Do we know that we have the right test scenarios? And then user acceptance testing, regardless of what you call this, right? It's the idea that you've built a large feature or significant part of the system and you've got it sort of out of the development crush, and now you want to get the end users involved in some validation. All right. So <clears throat> I have an actual example here. And what we're going to talk about is a scenario of an appliance manufacturer. And this example actually comes out from something that is uh, close to things I've worked on in the past. And it's the idea that any manufacturer, maker of anything, has to plan out what they're building for future years. So it's the notion of, you know, currently most everything is done on paper or Excel because every business runs on Excel at the end of the day. And you need to start planning out some fairly significant things around your future year model releases. So I've got this many models and they've got these kinds of features. Um, and I think for this market, I want to build this many of these units and this many of those units. Okay, if you think about this, when you're talking about manufacturing and you talk about model configuration, there's a lot of stuff that wraps into that. There's marketing, there's sales that uh, goes into that. There's the actual manufacturing pipeline. But to get the manufacturing pipeline, the actual line working, you've got huge amounts of inventory all behind this, right? So planning out future years um, releases can be extremely, extremely complex because <clears throat> you've got to take in a huge amount of variables. And there's a huge, huge risk here. So I actually worked on something very similar at a uh, Fortune 10 company. Um, it's a global auto manufacturer. I can't say their name because of NDA, but they make a car that looks a lot like a Mustang. Um, <clears throat> and they were working on a system that was just like this. And so if you think about an auto, think about the different models of that auto, the different configurations within each of those autos, and then you push that out to scale, 
and then you push that out across all of the different lines for that audio manufacturer, the system that I was working on, that is, I'm using this as kind of skinny example of that, we literally had hundreds of millions of dollars at risk if we did that work wrong. Just think about it, you completely miscount or compute a release line, and that impacts inventory, it impacts, it just, it's bad. Okay, so, at ideation, Let's say in this example of what we're trying to do, refrigerator manufacturer, the stakeholder says that they want to build a system that will let them control and work with that configuration. Moreover, um, <coughs> they want to get off of Excel, they want to do it on the web, and the stakeholder wants to provide that to uh, the users via a mobile app, because everything's mobile, right? Okay, so that's what the stakeholder initially talks about. And oftentimes, we don't get involved in those conversations early. But what we need to do is help that stakeholder understand the total cost and the total complexity of what's involved there, because the stakeholder likely doesn't know anything about dependent systems. They don't know anything about testing. They just have that, biz that business need. And what we're trying to do, remember, is give the stakeholder the right information to make intelligent decisions. So we just want the stakeholder to know, does this make sense? Or should we just go get alcohol right now and stop? I'll warn you, my jokes are not gonna get any better. Okay, so if we're talking about quality, and remember, quality is that higher level thing, it's not just technical stuff, the stakeholder needs to understand some larger aspects here, all right? So, about this thing, what are the riskiest parts of this business idea? I mean, and this doesn't necessarily mean it's technical. Um, what's the best value proposition? Uh, is the customer audience right? Do we have the correct target platforms? Do we understand system integration and dependencies? So let me ask, and again, I'd ask all of you to wake up for a moment. How many of you get involved in these kinds of discussions early in a product life cycle. Maybe about five or six hands in the entire room. Okay, for those of you that didn't raise your hands, how many of you think this would be useful conversations to have? Pretty much everybody's hands should have gone up. If your neighbor is snoring, hit them with an elbow and wake them up. <clears throat> so if you step back and think about in your experience, in your history of product development, of systems that you're working on, how many problems have you had, huge, epic problems, that could have been headed off with decisions and discussions and collaboration before the first line of code got written, before the first release planning session got made? So my point is, pushing these conversations to when that stakeholder is doing their planning and their decision making, that's powerful. So at this point, some of the conversations might go like, um, okay, uh, so did you realize that um, we've got problems with our data access? We have stability problems, we have data validity problems, meaning we're getting invalid and dirty data. Um, and if you want to do something that's going to automate this and use existing inventory and using existing data info, because of the risk of this, we need to spend a significant of time just getting that clean. That might change the stakeholder's decision right there. Um, mobile. Everything's mobile. Everything's sexy. <clears throat> For those of you that are testers, you're probably thinking mobile sucks because we have 947 different variants of Android, and that's even before we get to the OS versions. Um, <coughs> we've got Apple, we've got all this other stuff, right? So just the testing matrix for mobile explodes. And stakeholders may or may not realize the impact of what it costs from just taking something they're thinking about as a web application and then moving that over to a broad platform uh, for mobile. 
So you might have decisions there with the stakeholder of, oh, okay, look, we'll just narrow it down to these set of mobile devices um, because nobody in the company uses these other ones, right? So understanding the target audience. The stakeholder won't think about that unless you have those conversations, right? Um, and performance. Performance is always one of the least understood aspects in any organization. Performance is sexy, it sounds cool, everybody wants to be fast. And rarely is, decision, is uh, business well informed enough to make a good rational decision on what type of scale they really need. You know, so, oh, <clears throat> I want to be able to support 10,000 concurrent users. We have five people in the country, in the company. Why do you want to do that? Do you understand the costs of that? Sure, there can be some architectural things that you can make to support future scaling, right? But again, setting those expectations early, you getting information about what the stakeholder needs, really needs, not just wants. So again, the outcome that you're trying to get from these kinds of conversations early, early, early in the game, at the ideation phase, before the stakeholder decides to run with this project, is helping the stakeholder make an informed decision. Okay, so uh, I think I talked about this already. Load and security are indeed business concerns, right? Yes, they're technical, but the stakeholder may make decisions about accepting certain kinds of security and performance risks. Okay, so in ideation, you're talking about a number of concerns. Do we have the right platforms? Do we understand the audience? Um, what kind of security do we really need? What kind of performance do we really need? Do we have a good understanding of this? The point being you're trying to get to decisions from the outcomes there. And through those conversations, in this little scenario, the uh, employer says, you know what, let's drop mobile. Uh, it's not worth the added effort and complexity. Uh, we're gonna use the existing security metaphors that we use for the rest of our system. And um, <clears throat> no, we don't need to support China. We're just gonna have something that'll work for the five people we have, okay? How much clearer now are things when you start to go into actual planning? Sorry, I had a question. Was it a question? It's okay. It, I'm okay with questions. Sorry, I should have said that earlier. All right. <clears throat> so we're narrowing down um, and getting a much better idea so we're not wasting any effort as we move forward. So now let's talk about release planning and design. And again, this is before anything gets written. We've got an agreement on what we're going to build, now it's time to talk a little bit more specifics. Uh, so we're thinking about what to build, right? Some actual technology decisions, some how, meaning how we're going to split out the tasks. Um, and now, this is where you really start to get into some ideas. Okay, we've got a central data warehouse that uh, holds our inventory, holds some projection data, holds some sales projections. We can make use of that. We're going to pull uh, data from that and we don't want to rewrite um, certain parts of the system, so we'll use some commercial off-the-shelf uh, products. And I used to work for Telerik, so I always use Kendo UI as a grid because I like it. Point being, you're starting to make some large decisions about the technologies, about the architecture, and about the direction, okay? So <clears throat> this is the point not later, but now, before you start um, throwing things over the fence to your testers, this is the point to think about your end user validation scenarios, your specifications, your criteria, whatever. Um, what you're trying to make sure is that you are tying functionality to specific use cases that are gonna be of value to people. And you wanna make sure that those flows, those epics, those user stories, whatever, are clear enough so that you understand what to build and the value that they're going to be delivering. You also wanna discuss infrastructure needs um, because trying to get infrastructure late in a project always sucks. And it sucks more the bigger in an organization you get. 
So the idea of, okay, we're going to want <coughs> to um, use some kind of virtualization. Docker solves everything, right? We'll want to use some kind of containers or virtualization at the developer level. Um, we're going to have several different staging environments that we're going to flow through. We need this sort of hardware. We need these virtualization, blah, 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 right? Start to plan that out before you build things. You do want to mitigate known issues. So I mentioned, as part of this example, that we might have problems around data stability, uh, data access stability, data clarity, data, um, you know, all, all of that good old data mess. Um, so some of the considerations at this phase, and remember, we're talking about release planning. Again, do we have clear business scenarios? That's the biggest thing. Do we understand the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, infrastructure and integration points, uh, you know, more about performance, more about security. So as you're sitting in these rooms, having these discussions, it makes sense that you're going to come up by covering some of these points. And in this particular case, uh, we get some <clears throat> agreement that there's some concern around the size of the data that we're going to be shipping to the end user systems, regardless of whether they're on a laptop or they're working at their desktop. Um, inventory and uh, configuration data tends to be very large, right? So we know that we're going to have to, in this particular issue, deal with that. We know that we might have third-party components, and we don't need to focus our testing on those. Rather, we need to focus our testing on usability, say, around the performance. Um, and also, at this point, being comfortable with performance and security. Okay, so that's the type of discussion and collaboration that we want to leave that release planning with. Are we comfortable enough about knowing the risk and being comfortable with the general direction? Okay, so now iteration planning. And this is where we're actually doing the work. And it doesn't matter if this is the first iteration or the 34th, the point being, you know, again, if you're using sprints, waterfall releases, whatever, this is the sort of cyclical planning that you're doing throughout the project, all right? So <clears throat> we're, gonna, we're actually doing working. And at the start of each of these phases, again, regardless of what environment you're using, do we have enough information to move forward, both for building and the testing that we're doing as part of this phase? So we need to have a clear picture of the timeline, right? Okay, so we're doing two-week sprints. I need to know the dependencies, okay? I'm waiting on infrastructure uh, for <clears throat> our new data warehouse. Um, we're waiting on the uh, data access folks to clean up a couple services that are providing us the data we need. That's over on their side. We can't do anything about it. We're dependent. Oh, I need that this iteration. Are they done? Can I negotiate to get them done, right? It's a risk for this iteration. Are we clear on those sorts of things? There's always the critical question that every time you pull off a piece of work, do you know why you're doing the work? And how many times through your job experience have you pulled off a work item or been assigned a work item, and you know what to do, but you don't know why you're doing it? Has anybody ever been there? I was there last week. <laughs> right? It happens, right? And the point of, being, of having that confusion is you're missing the broader understanding. You're missing the value of what it is you're doing. It may turn out that um, there are just a few things you don't know. And if you get some answers to questions, oh, I understand this better now and you're better equipped to actually do good work on that. But if you don't understand the why you're building, and you go ask some questions, it may turn out that this is really a low-value, worthless piece of work. You know, why are we doing this one thing? And everybody kind of shrugs, don't know. Well, it might turn out that the system had changed, the needs had changed. Should we still do this work? Is there more valuable work I can do? 
this is dumb, let's not do it. Let's go find something that does contribute value. And you need to be asking that at every iteration planning, sprint planning, whatever, right? You're looking at the things that the stakeholder has prioritized or that you've got scheduled, however it is. Do you understand what you're building? Do you understand why you're building it? Who here really loves making test data? I'm sorry. <laughs> Only one person raised their hands. So it is kind of cool, right? But test data takes a long time to build up. When you get into that iteration, as you're looking about the things you need, as you're looking at the things you're building, take a step back and make sure that you've got the things you need to build and test that with. Do you know the test data that you have to build? Do you have it in hand? Is, are you, do you have to wait for somebody else to build you that data? Are there tools that you can build to help you create that test data. Something we tend to forget about is that, oh, I can write software that will help me make prerequisites. <clears throat> so this is a great thing to understand at the start of those iterations. Also, a little bit of discussion around, um, for those work items, what do we think we want to automate around them? What are we gonna leave for uh, exploratory testing or manual testing? Do we have accessibility testing needs, right? <clears throat> so for any one particular uh, iteration, this might be like the outcome of that iteration planning meeting. All right, yes, we've got all of our test data ready. Um, we might be missing a few things, but it's okay to push those off a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we've got all of our dependencies. We're good to go. All right, now you get to start that sprint, that iteration, whatever, knowing that you at least don't have any major surprises. There are always going to be little surprises, but we're trying to like shrink the risk of that, all right? So now it's time to actually build things. Um, who here does pair programming? Oh, that's nice. Probably, I don't know, 15, 20% of the room, that's nice. Does anybody here pair with your developers and your testers? Two hands straight up and a couple, uh, sort of, but those testers are really scary people. <clears throat> so for those of you that aren't pairing, I'd encourage you to give it a try. I am not one of the dogmatic fanatics that says 100% of your work has to be done pair programming, but there are extraordinary benefits that come out of it. And I would also encourage you to consider pairing not just with another developer, but with a tester, or a BA, or a PM, or oh my God, even maybe the stakeholder. That's really scary, because <clears throat> they're just weird. Um, why do you want to do that? Um, so pairing's hard. I'm an introvert, which may sound really weird because I'm standing in front of y'all talking, but like I'm going to go cry in a dark room later. Um, Pair programming is hard because you are right next to somebody and all of this fear comes up of, oh my God, first off, they're weird and I've had arguments, but then also fear about my own skills. So I've been doing software development a whole lot of years and I still don't know how to write a web service. I still don't know how to get, write good SQL and yet I'm supposed to sit down next to somebody and I'm gonna show what a complete idiot I am. All right, so there's a lot of fear around pair programming. But as you start to move past that, you get extraordinary benefits, particularly when you're working with a different role. So when a developer pairs up with a tester, <clears throat> what kind of testing or unit tests do developers notoriously write? Happy path tests. Oh, here's my four happy path tests. We're done, ship it off. And the tester will go, oh no, you forgot about these 68 other things. And the tester then goes, or the developer then pulls their hair out. <clears throat> and the developer says to the tester, you just told me 68 things. Of those, how many do we have that maybe actually have a 98% chance of ever happening? And the tester will think back and say, five. Okay, so then you do the five and you leave the other 93 off, right? <clears throat> but you don't learn those until you start working closely with those other roles. And when you pair with a stakeholder, um, 
all of a sudden you start to learn so much more about the business and they start to learn about things like why not accepting technical debt matters. The stakeholder says, oh, um, why is it taking you so much time here to get through this one piece of code? And you get the opportunity to nicely say, <clears throat> you forced some time constraints on us last sprint, you made us take some shortcuts, now I'm having to fix those shortcuts, and instead of simply doing this work in an hour, it's now taking me six hours because I have to fix that other thing. And the stakeholder will say, oh. And the next time that pressure comes around, they'll be more informed. So those cross-role pairings, even though I just have dev tester here, are extraordinary opportunities to ship better quality and to better educate the entire team. So <clears throat> some of the example, and you know, after talking about multi-role things here, I'm focusing only on dev tester. Um, again, you get great practical help, great practical learning, great practical value, because you'll get immediate answers and immediate resolution around things like unclear use cases. Oh, wait, we don't understand what this is. Oh, let's go ask the stakeholder. Um, we're only getting simplistic testing done here. We need to do some combinatorial testing to make sure we're cutting risk of this. Those sorts of things. Um, and the testers will learn extraordinary things by better understanding some of the technical details as well. So when you're doing the work, this is actually in the iteration, um, what isn't clear? Are we missing something? Do I need more answers? Um, you also get perhaps one of the most important things here, that the right things are being tested in the right places. So the idea of having a good mix of unit tests a nice mix of integration tests that are testing services and a very, very few UI tests or end-to-end -end tests with little overlap. So you may have had stories like this happen before. With my current uh, large auto manufacturing client that I was at, the first week that I went in there, <clears throat> they brought me in to help write Selenium WebDriver tests. And the testers hand me a list of 60 tests for this grid to check calculations on the grid. And I cried a little bit because this grid was a horrible grid to work with. It wasn't the Telerik product, it was somebody else. Um, and it was just awful because it's like, update this cell, update this cell, does this cell have the right value? 68 instances of that from the UI writing Selenium WebDriver, which if any of you have written, can, well, any UI testing is tough. Um, and so I asked the testers, well, wait a minute, you're, you're just wanting me to verify the calculations, is that right? And they nod their heads, yes. And I asked, well, do you know if the developers did any unit testing on this? And the two testers like turn to each other and literally go, say, well, do you think you could ask the developers if they've written any unit tests? Do you know where the developers are? I already knew the answer to this question. And they didn't shrug. This was, I didn't get a shrug here. They said, because the developers were literally in chairs on the other side of the cubicle. So it's like, okay, look, here, let me turn your chair around. So turn their chairs around, because they were nervous. I had to kind of help them turn their chairs. The chairs were rusty, because they'd never turned them over this way. <clears throat> and we had a conversation with the developers. Um, <clears throat> oh, and by the way, this is that example that I gave of hundreds of millions of dollars at risk if the calculations were wrong. This was that system. And they didn't know what testing was being done. So I asked the develop we asked the developers, Are you, do you have any unit tests in place? And they said, yeah, we got 100% unit tests on the calculations uh, using Jasmine because we've customized this in the JavaScript and the browser, so we got 100% unit tests. And I'm thinking, thank God, because now I don't have to write those 68 tests. <clears throat> but what was missing was this understanding of what tests were in the right place. So had I not been there, <clears throat> these other two testers would have written these 68 tests 
that were slow, brittle, awful, and 100% duplicated tests that were elsewhere. Oops. I mean, you developers, hopefully all, you all know about dry, right? Don't repeat yourself. Not understanding test coverage <clears throat> is one of the worst dry violations that's easy to fix. How do you fix it? Communication. You actually have, you have to turn those rusty chairs, talk to somebody else, understand. And if you do that communication before you start writing code, you eliminate all that waste and you're focused. Okay, so at this point, in this example, <clears throat> we end up with little or no overlap. Sometimes you're going to have some overlap of tests. It's just how tests work, particularly when you're going from unit to integration to UI or end-to-end -end tests, right? There's going to be some overlap, but it's okay overlap because you've made it thoughtfully. Um, you're probably going to discover some new use cases, both for test and maybe for functionality. But you've discovered that when the cost of fixing those is tiny. Um, so at this point now, we've built and promoted or delivered to a different environment some value working software. So now we're up to the point of user acceptance testing. And <clears throat> this may not surprise you, but I have some opinions about user acceptance testing. And the idea that <clears throat> we simply promote stuff out to a UAT environment and let some users kind of poke around on the system and do bug bashes um, if you're doing that, please stop. And that's just as polite as I'll be able to say that. The idea of having unfocused user acceptance testing, again, the 1960s called, they want their software development processes back. Just, just stop it. The better way to make effective, useful user acceptance testing, regardless of how you term it, regardless of how you do it, right? This is the point of where your users are validating how stuff works is get them involved early, early, early. Back during those early planning stages. Make sure that the criteria are, <clears throat> excuse me, make sure that the criteria are clear. Make sure that you know what they're doing and also help them by informing them of the types of testing you've done. Now you probably are not gonna crack into unit testing of um, complex algorithms with them, but telling them Look, all of these calculations on this uh, manufacturing forecasting page, here's the types of testing we've done. And we're completely confident about these types of testing, so don't spend any time on that. Maybe if you want to spend five, 10 minutes to just kind of poke around and get some comfort, but here I can show you the reports of all of these tests that run every time we build the software, and we're 100% confident that of these tests, of this area, it's solid. So don't spend much time there. What I'd like you to do, end user, is focus on, does this help you do your job? Did we get the domain right? Did we get the workflow right? That's when user acceptance testing becomes really, really valuable. Because if you don't take the time to set up that UAT testing to that level, then it's a waste. You're getting lousy bug reports. You're getting low value feedback instead of, is this helping them do their jobs better? All right. So <clears throat> considerations at this point. Understanding test coverage. How many of you are fairly confident about understanding the overlap and coverage that you have in your existing code bases for unit integration and end-to-end -end testing. Not a single hand went up. Let me repeat that. So first off, take a breath, wake back up. <laughs> the question is, <clears throat> are you confident, yes or no, that you have a fairly good feeling about what your code coverage looks like, that you know what areas are covered with unit tests what areas are covered with integration, and what areas are covered with functional testing. I still don't see one hand. 
Uh, no confidence. No confidence. Okay. <clears throat> ah, there's one hand in the back. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, is that a problem? We like to talk about technical debt in our system code bases, yet how often do we ignore technical debt in the test code base? Test code is production code. It's absolutely production code, and you have to treat it with the same love and care and tears and alcohol <laughs> that you have to treat the system code with. Because if you don't understand what your coverage looks like, first off, you may be completely missing swaths of significant, big areas of significant risk, and that's scary. You may have areas that have an insane amount of overlap. For example, you may have 100% unit test coverage on an algorithm. You may have that same, uh, that same algorithm method or class called by four or eight or 10 web services that are also running through all the permutations. And then on top of that, because your automation testers, your QAs, your, your <clears throat> front end testers didn't know anything that was being done, they've now gone and wrote those 68 functional tests so now you've got at least three layers of duplication of the same stuff. That's a problem. So <clears throat> work on that. Um, ensuring that you're meeting the needs of the customer. That's the big goal of the end of any work item, right? We've done valuable work. All right. <clears throat> so at the end of UAT, the users are happy. We've solved their problem. They're not hurting and crying as much. They're actually able to focus on other things, and that's extraordinary. So at that point, you're done. Ship it, deliver it, go home. OK, so <clears throat> I'm wrapping up here. Uh, the earlier you can get conversations around quality, the better. Only about 10 or 15 excuse me, percent of the room raised their hands when I asked, if you got involved at the ideation phase. So that's something I'd encourage you to see if you can start to get involved with because you can have extraordinary impact on the business. If, you, if the business is looking at three different things and they have an idea that uh, uh, option A is one month, option B, is, or item A is one month, item B is two weeks, and item C is another month, all right? So they're thinking item A is something that is important. But when you talk to them and you talk about the risks of mobility and you talk about the risks of existing data and that item A is actually four to six months, but that you're still confident about B and C, the stakeholder can say, let's push A off and do these other two things instead. That's extraordinary impact on the business. You've changed the course of the business. You've avoided risk. You've avoided pain and anger and frustration because if you started on A and it turns into four to six months, the stakeholder is going to be really pissed off, right? But they made, that cha they, they made that choice not knowing the impacts. If you help initially make those sorts of decisions, that's extraordinary. Why are we building this? It, what's important to know? I'm also lazy. <clears throat> I like to be able to do the right level of work, meaning I don't want to waste my time, I don't want to have to go back and rework things, and I want to do work that's valuable. And so if I'm having important conversations throughout the entire phase of a product life cycle, I can ensure that I'm not wasting my time, I can ensure that I'm keeping the stakeholder happy, that the customers are happy as, as much as they can be. And at the end of the day, just want to ship great stuff. All right, so I'd like to remind you, <coughs> there's a survey for each of the uh, talks. Um, the URL, I think, is on the kind of automated rotating splash page. Uh, if, you like this, if you like the session, please fill out the survey. I'm Jim Holmes. If you didn't like the session, my name's Burke Holland. <laughs> so thank you very much.
If you have questions, please come on down. We've got a few minutes until the next session starts. I'll be hanging around uh, in the halls. And remember, Jim at Guidepost Systems, please feel free to email me. Thank you very much for your time.